I'm Peter Stroot, the founder of Western Auto Trove Company, doing business as Glixen. In this video, I'm going to provide my perspective on autotrophic microbiology that includes a major discovery on how they grow, as well as predictions of novel autotrophic microbes. I will provide several examples on how to commercialize this new knowledge. I'll end this video with a call to action on how to move forward with commercialization. In order to describe my discovery, I think it's important to take a step back in time about 20 years back to when I was a graduate student back at Illinois. So my journey started back as a graduate student at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign over 20 years ago. Now I just finished my general engineering degree at Illinois and I was going on to my graduate work in environmental engineering. I was offered a job with the U.S. Army Searle Lab that's over in Champaign. And there I worked with a team of researchers on developing a new software package to evaluate various energy saving and water saving technologies for the military. So that was interesting and during that time I was completing my coursework and I had to make a decision. Um, I could have taken the easy way out and just simply written up a report based on my work with USA Army Sur U.S. Army Searle, but I chose the hard path. Instead, I was getting really interested in bioreactor systems as it relates to renewable energy, things like anaerobic digesters and ethanol fermentation. And when you read the literature at that time, it became very clear to me that there were two major camps. There were the engineers who really understood bioreactors and math, but didn't know anything about microbiology. And then there were the microbiologists that knew a lot about microbiology and molecular biology, but quite frankly, were scared of math. Sorry. So there was a huge gap between the two groups. And I'm an engineer, and I figured the best way to make a contribution to really understand these systems and to try to move them forward would be for this engineer to volunteer to learn more about microbiology. So I expressed my interest to my master's advisor, my graduate advisor, that was Lute Raskin, of all people. She was a new professor at University of Illinois. And she put me on her team uh, investigating anaerobic digesters. Now, this is a collaborative project with some professors from the Department of Animal Sciences. So a joint venture, if you think of it that way, between environmental engineering and animal science microbiologists. So that was quite interesting. I did a, several experiments studying the um, effect of different operating conditions for anaerobic digesters fed the organic fraction of municipal solid waste. That sounds god awful, but all it actually is is food and paper waste. So I was able to run some reactors, take some samples, evaluate them, quite exciting. We were interested in the microbiology of these samples uh, that we would collect and we were using something called membrane hybridization at the time to measure the amount of methanogens and sulfate reducing bacteria present in these reactors. So all brand new stuff, terribly exciting for me. I loved it. Uh, I asked, uh, you can ask any of the folks in my old lab uh, that used to work with me, I asked a lot of questions, but that's just the nature of the beast. That's what I like to do. I like to ask a lot of questions and I learned a lot working um, over in animal sciences. I'd spent a lot of time over there working in the labs of Rod Mackey and Brian White. Now, this lab was no ordinary lab, okay? This was the former lab of Marvin P. Bryant. Now, for those of you in the know, you might recognize that name. He's the fellow that started Applied and Environmental Microbiology, the journal, AEM. That's right. He also discovered centrophic bacteria. So he has a hardcore anaerobic microbiology laboratory, and, and Rod and Brian were we're still managing it and trying to keep moving forward um, with all the new molecular biology techniques that were out there and trying to really move it forward into the 21st century. Um, so very exciting time to be around the University of Illinois. We also had Ralph Wolf was still around, the, the godfather of methanogens, a good friend of Marv Bryant's. He was still around and active. Carl Wos was on campus. That's right, the Carl Wos. And he was also um, impacted by Marv Bryant because Marv and Ralph were the ones that figured out how to grow methanogens and provided methanogens to Carl Wos, who made the discovery of Archaea. So all that was going on at Illinois, and I was right there in the middle of it as a young graduate student. Yeah, I was much younger back then. During the course of my studies on anaerobic digestion, we were um, always experiencing or learning about 
uh, volatile fatty acid buildup in anaerobic digesters that were fed too much food. Uh, you'd feed a digester too much food, and all hell would break loose. The methanogens couldn't keep up to produce methane, and you would get acetate buildup, and then propionic acid buildup, and butyric acid buildup, and some of the other branch chain VFAs or short chain fatty acids. They would build up, and this would cause a problem for digesters because it would reduce the pH, causing a sour digester. So I would look at the profiles and watch what's going on, learn more in the literature, and I really wasn't that convinced by the conventional explanation that somehow they would be overfed, the reactors would be in the fermenters that go nuts, and they would shift their fermentation from basically acetic acid fermentation to propionic acid and butyric acid. To me, that didn't seem like it really made a lot of sense. Maybe there's another possibility. So I started kicking around the idea that maybe there's something called a propiogen in these reactors. That would be an organism that could take hydrogen, CO2, and acetic acid to make propionic acid. So I thought that might be possible. And if you start looking at the thermodynamics of that reaction, what you'll realize is that we're normally taught propionate oxidation is difficult unless you have a CO2 reducing methanogen to keep the hydrogen partial pressure very low. Then it's favorable. But if you think about it, all you have to do is take that reaction and flip it around. And what was unfavorable for propionate oxidation, propionate formation actually is very favorable. So that's uh, very interesting. It's like, why hasn't anybody thought of this or looked for it? So I gave it a shot as a graduate student. I actually made the effort to try to isolate a propiogen, and at the same time a butyrogen. So that's a butyric acid forming organism. So I made, a, made an effort at least. So I had access to the anaerobic microbiology lab. So I learned some methods there, learning from some of the uh, skilled microbiologists there. So I learned how to make a Hungate roll tube, uh, learned how to use the anaerobic tent, and started doing all sorts of uh, funny things. But I started learning uh, how to do all these anaerobic methods, and I gave it a shot. And I would um, use the Hungate roll tube method. I've provided a, a link below. Um, you can take a look at that. Okay, and what you see when you see that little picture is that it has auger on the inside surface. So I used to make these things all the time. And then I would take something I thought was an enrichment for propiogen, dilute it, and smear it on the inside surface, stopper it up, and flush the headspace with, just like that diagram shows, something like 20% CO2, seal it up, and go put it in the warm room, and check back a week later to see if there's anything going on on the surface. Can I see any colonies? And occasionally I would see small little colonies growing, but they never get that big. And then I would take those colonies and transfer them to a liquid medium, and I would use the same kind of balsh tube, but with liquid media at the bottom, and let it sit for like a week or so, and then take small samples out carefully, and then go measure uh, short-chain fatty acids over in Hans Blaschek's lab. So he was right around the corner in the food science area, but he had a GC he was kind enough to let me use, and I would run it through there, and occasionally I would see propionic acid, butyric acid show up on the GC. So right there I knew I was on the right track, I just didn't have the the organism in a tube, as they say, close, but no cigar. But uh, this was really interesting to me, uh, trying to get this to work. Now, you'll notice in that bulge tube diagram, they use 20% CO2, we use 20% CO2 all the time. Now, why is that? Why not something less? Why not something more? Why 20%? Well, it all gets back to some of the earlier work done by Marv, Brian, and others, where they had the, they had the, I think it was a really good idea. They would try to replicate the environmental conditions uh, as they found them. So in this case, it'd be the rumen, like a cow's gut. And they would try to mimic it as best they could and try to isolate novel organisms by using different selective media. But they're always careful with the gas um, concentration to try to mimic what's happening in the rumen. And 20% CO2 seemed like a good number for them. And and they would supplement with hydrogen instead of methane if they're going to go for different organisms. So they would try that out. And their thinking was that, well, it's just like what's in the room, and so let's try to replicate that. And the organisms must like it. So they used that approach to isolate methanogens and all sorts of organisms. And they just kept using the same approach. That was the fatal flaw. Just because you can observe the organism in that environment doesn't mean it's the ideal environment for that organism. It just means it can survive or grow in that environment. That doesn't mean much of anything as far as organisms concerned. 
It's just making a living slowly. So I kind of gave up on the Propagen. I, I kind of, I gave up on it. I had to move on to other things. I went on to a PhD over at University of Cincinnati, and then eventually I made my way to University of South Florida as a faculty member. And that's where I picked up the Autotroph um, research or line of research for a second time. But this time I decided to start with nitrifying bacteria. Okay, so with nitrifying bacteria at that time, so this is early in my faculty years, I considered the idea that maybe, maybe these nitrifying bacteria are carbon limited in our aeration basin at our wastewater treatment plant. That might explain why they grow so slow. Because still, I hadn't really, I hadn't really put two and two together yet. Instead, I was still searching for this reasons why this organism grows so slow. It's like maybe they just don't get enough carbon. Let's just let's. How do we test that? So we went out and bought a soluble CO2 probe and sent a student out, Ray Morse. Uh, he went out to the different treatment plants with me, and, and he'd go on his own, and we'd measure soluble CO2 in the aeration basin throughout, at the very beginning and at the end, and take a different depths and just take a look and measure. No one's ever, to my knowledge, ever done that before. So we were doing that and taking measurements of different BNR systems. So BNR is biological nutrient removal systems, whether it's a barton fo 4 stage or barton fo 5 stage or a modified lutzak ettinger process. We just went to a bunch of different treatment plants and we just kept on measuring. And the numbers were all over the place. So we'd see numbers uh, like at the beginning of the aeration basin, it'd be uh, really high levels of CO2. And then as you move towards the end, it would start to reduce. So we're seeing this range or variable CO2 levels that got our attention. Um, we started taking samples, and we do fish all the time. That's fluorescence and situ hybridization. We look at the four major nitrifying bacteria groups, and we take a look on the microscope and see if we see anything funny. And we'd see a mixture. Usually, all four types were there, and it's really getting kind of odd. So Ray and I worked together on developing bench scale systems that he could control the CO2 concentration in the reactors, and started trying to focus exclusively on nitrification. So we made media that stripped out all the carbon you know, um, carbon source for heterotrophs, and we just tried to enrich for nitrifiers and put them on a cycle and see if we can actually enrich for nitrifiers for very, very specific conditions to see what would happen. And we take samples out and go do fish and take a look and see what's going on. And then we can measure the nitrification rate because we bought ammonium, nitride, and nitrate probes, so we can monitor that at the same time. So we we worked together, and Ray did some great work. It's the uh, dissertation. I gave you a link down below. You can follow that for more information. So we worked together on this, and Ray and I, we went back and forth and came to the conclusion that something doesn't make sense here. Monokinetics doesn't work for these nitrifying bacteria. Maybe there's something else going on. And there's another equation that not many people are aware of called Andrew's Equation. I'll show that next. Okay, the Andrews equation is a little bit different than the Minot equation. So with Andrews equation, it gives you the ability to also model into the equation um, inhibition. So what it does is at higher levels of CO2, in our case, it actually becomes inhibitory for autotrophs like nitrifying bacteria and others. So instead, there's a sweet spot where the, the, the organism likes to grow with respect to soluble CO2. How interesting. So if you think back to those balch tubes I just showed you where they're 20% CO2, or you know something about anaerobic digesters, you know they're operating at 40, 45% CO2 in the headspace. You start wondering about that. Maybe there's something else going on. Maybe they're growing so slowly because we're inhibiting them with by not taking care of the CO2 concentration. That was the discovery. Now, to be fair, at first, oh, I made this great discovery, but actually the botanist knew about this with plants. So here's a link. And that's for greenhouse. CO2 concentration. They've known about this, that there's a sweet spot for the plants they like to grow. Well, plants are autotrophs too. They're photosynthetic autotrophs. They're not microbes. 
They're from the other, they're from the eukarya. Okay, they're not bacteria, they're not archaea, but they are autotrophs and they have a preference for CO2. And you can see that in that link I gave you. So they've known about this, but for some reason my friends in microbiology weren't aware of that. Neither was I. I mean, guilty. <laughs> so, so this discovery, although it's not groundbreaking, it's big for autotrophic microbiologists because it sh sheds some light on some of our past pains and what the future might hold. That there's lots of opportunities for us to take advantage of this to help some of our current uh, biological processes that use autotrophic microbes like nitrifying bacteria, methanogens, anamox, sulfate reducing bacteria, all sorts of organisms, even dechlorinating bacteria. Yeah, there are lots of autotrophs out there that could probably benefit from this knowledge that we can provide them with a better environment. So, this discovery of how nitrifying bacteria behave, and I went on and did some additional experiments with anaerobic digesters and anamox, uh, resulted in multiple patents uh, that were granted uh, that are now uh, property of the University of South Florida, and I provide a link for those. You can take a look at those down below. So, after I left the U. Uh, so after I left the University of South Florida, I formed the Western Autotroph Company which is now doing business as Glixen. But originally it was focused on autotrophs. I was very much interested in autotrophs. I was able to uh, license the patents from USF and I started pursuing uh, commercialization of various technologies. But I try to focus on my bread and butter, wastewater uh, treatment systems. And I kept trying and trying, um, but it became clear to me I'm a one man that doesn't have enough capital to go after some of these markets all on my own. So I gave it a shot for a few years. I even presented at the um, WERF lift program in Manhattan several years ago, and I thought I had some interest there on nitromorph technology, but that seemed to fall through. So at that time, I switched over to blood oxidative stress. That's my current uh, primary interest. Now, why would I switch to something like blood oxidative stress? because that market is much, much larger than anything on the autotroph side. So I'll repeat, I'm only focusing on blood oxidative stress at this time because it's a much larger market compared to the autotroph markets. So it doesn't mean the autotroph opportunities aren't there and they're not lucrative, of course they are. It's just blood oxidative stress looks like it has a lot more potential, maybe, I don't know, 100,000 times more would be my estimate. but. That doesn't mean we shouldn't pursue autotrophs and try to figure out ways to exploit this discovery and what I'm going to tell you next about novel autotrophs. Okay, well, as far as the autotrophs, all the patents at USF are still available to be licensed. I've had a few companies sniff around a little bit, a little bit of interest, um, but I'm not sure they quite understood the opportunity or the potential of these. Now, there's two parts to it. There's the discovery as, as it relates to CO2 growth, um, but there's a second part to it that isn't in the patents, but it was in a patent application that I um, submitted to the USPTO that was rejected because they rely too much on the USF patents and the USF patents trumped them. So I couldn't get that through as an actual patent. However, the information is still out there in the public and I'm just going to give you the uh, summary version of that, but all the information is out there. I've provided links to those too, to, to that patent application, and you're welcome to review that if you want. So let's, um, let's learn more about these opportunities. We'll start with all those related to the CO2 discovery, and then I'll switch gears to the, the possibility of novel autotrophs. You want to watch that. So in this part, I'm going to show you some more information about how CO2 impacts our wastewater treatment systems. There'll be three different um, areas that I'm going to talk about. One is BNR systems, the second one will be anaerobic digesters, and the third will be Animox. But we'll try to get through these pretty quick. Okay, for BNR systems, primarily I'm interested in the four different nitrifying bacteria that are found there. Now, you know that nitrified bacteria come in pairs. You have an AOB, you have an NOB. That just means ammonium oxidizing bacteria and you have nitrite oxidizing bacteria. You have to have both if you want to have complete nitrification. That means ammonium going all the way to nitrate. 
you know, some of the original work done with nitrifying bacteria uh, reported about Nitrosomonas and Nitrobacter, the first AOB and NOB reported in the literature. Now, if you really dig into that literature, what you'll find is that they use room air for aerating these enrichment reactors and for the isolation work. Now, that means the CO2 level is extremely low, which also means in an open system, that means CO2 low, pH high. Now, here you go. Let's show you the figure that's of interest to you. Now, this one, this is the compilation of our work, Ray Morse's work, my work, working together, trying to come up with the Andrews equation for the various populations that would explain all the bioreactor work that we did. So there's two pairs shown there. There's a pair of um, high pH nitrifiers and the low pH nitrifiers. The high pH nitrifiers are again nitrosomonas and nitrobacter. And you'll see they prefer very low soluble CO2 as expected. They grow really fast if you can get the CO2 level really low, but that never happens in our aeration basins at the wastewater treatment plant. Nope, never. Um, but you'll also see nitrospire, nit nitrosospire, and nitrospire is the other pair of nitrifying bacteria. They're the low pH nitrifiers. They're the ones that prefer higher soluble CO2. Now you take a look at that figure again, and you'll see these two peaks. You'll see the peak for the high pH CO2, very sharp peak. It looks like it goes around five milligrams per liter soluble CO2. That works where it peaks out and then drops off considerably down around 20 milligrams per liter. You get up to 30 milligrams per liter, 40 milligrams per liter. And they're not very happy. The low pH nitrifiers, however, are growing well. They don't like low CO2. They like higher soluble CO2. And what we'll see in the treatment plants, we'll see both pairs. So why do you think that is? Here's the answer. The answer is that our aeration basin has soluble suit soluble CO2 levels that shift usually from high to low from the beginning to the end of the aeration basin. But nitrification is usually occurring throughout the aeration basin because it's a slow process. So that means towards the front end of the aeration basin or the entry of it, that you're probably going to be cultivating the organisms that have a preference for high soluble CO2. In a lot of activity, a lot of heterotrophic activity, that BOD is being converted to CO2. It's there. So you're probably getting a lot of uh, nitrospire, nitrospire action or activity right there. And then towards the end of the basin, where you're getting a lot of stripping of the CO2, now you're starting to provide conditions for the high pH loving nitrifying bacteria. So that would explain why you have both pairs present. Now, that sounds lovely. Um, some people, some authors have even suggested that this is a sign of diversity and that's really good for the system. And I would make the counter argument that no, what that means is that your system is very inefficient. If you have both pairs that are say at equal biomass levels, well, if one's growing really fast, the other one's growing really poor, and then later one's growing fast, the other one's growing poor, that means your overall nitrification rate has to be suboptimal. So, what that really means to me is that you should choose one or the other. And I think the only choice here is that you are either going to aerate the hell out of your aeration basin to try to strip out CO2 to keep it nice and low for the high pH loving uh, nitrifiers, or you're going to supplement some CO2 in the aeration basin to maintain a higher level soluble CO2 in the aeration basin to try to promote the growth of nitrospire, nitrospira throughout the entire basin. So you effectively select for them 100% so they're active everywhere at a high rate. So that was one of my uh, original works uh, of suggesting that that is a technology that we should consider. So you'd have to measure soluble CO2 in the basin and then come up with a CO2 injection plan. So you have to partner with an industrial CO2 supplier to try to even out or stabilize the soluble CO2 level in the aeration basin to try to improve nitrification. All right, here's the second wastewater treatment process, the anaerobic digester. As discussed earlier, we know, those out in the field know that anaerobic digesters, the biogas is going to have some range, say 35 to 45% CO2 
in the gas phase, right? Really high, and there's nothing really you can do about that if you just leave it as is. I mean, you're taking carbohydrate material and protein, protein and fat, of course. You're breaking that material down to its most reduced form, methane, and most oxidized form, CO2. That's the anaerobic digestion process. You're always going to be producing CO2. Now, what I did, I set up some small little bench scale anaerobic digesters right before I left the USF. I had about a week, and I just went ahead and did a rush job and went through and set up reactors identical, identical feed, identical inoculum, which is the anaerobic digester sludge from the treatment plant, and set up different headspace concentrations to start with. And what I observed was that when I start with a very, very, very low CO2 concentration, um, and just basically nitrogen gas compared to, say, 20% CO2 and 50% CO2 in the gas phase, I saw a very marked improvement in biogas formation in the volume. Now, some of you might say, well, maybe some CO2 came out of the liquid phase and into the gas phase. Uh -huh. What I did is I flushed it multiple times to try to counter that, to make sure that didn't happen. I tested that. So... It's not coming from the liquid phase, it's coming from biological activity, biogas formation. So if you think about it, what I told you earlier, most likely the methanogens are being inhibited. We're holding them back. So we need to figure out a way to get our CO2 levels lower. Now this, this next slide below, I'm gonna show you. What you're seeing there is new, uh, specific growth rate versus CO2 concentration, and I came up with two sets of estimated parameters for both acetoclastic methanogens and CO2 reducing methanogens, both a low and a high as a function of soluble CO2, and give you some ideas on how much we're probably inhibiting them. Now, this is based on some very preliminary work I did, wasn't published, just gas formation and how to explain that, what actually must have happened, what does explain it, and plotted on there. If you take take a look, you'll see I have conventional operation of between 35 and 50 percent CO2. It's probably more like 35 to 40 percent, but it's that's where we're operating right now. It's really really low performance for methanogens. So if we just simply reduce our CO2 concentration, there's a good chance that we can actually spur on more methanogenesis, get higher rates of biogas formation. Now that's quite exciting if you think about it. If we have a way to do that because that would mean some of our oversized reactors, and maybe we could feed them a lot more organics without the risk of sour digester. So think about that. And this is, again, another example where we just assume that the environment that's provided is the optimal environment for the organism because it's there. No, that's, the, that's an environment it can grow in. It doesn't mean it's the optimal environment for it to grow. So we have to be thinking about that. In this case, the autotrophs need to be taken care of. And if we do that, they're really the bottleneck here. Last but not least, Animox. Everyone's favorite organism in wastewater treatment for the last, whatever, 15, 20 years. Recall that they were the Animox. Recall that the Animox was predicted by thermodynamics several, I think it was two or three decades ago. So somebody did the thermodynamic analysis, reported it, and said, it looks favorable for growth. I wonder if the organism's there. 10 years later, they reported the isolation of the first Animox metabolism, or first organism that does Animox. Quite exciting. Now, if you look back in the literature, you'll notice that the CO2 concentration they used, very high, if I remember correctly, 20% CO2. Is it any surprise it took them? 10 years to enrich and isolate for an Animox. I'll tell you what I did near the end of my term at USF. I also was interested in Animox too, and I figured, you know, I've got bioreactor systems. I've got probes. I've got all sorts of things. I've got a good educated guess hypothesis. Maybe Animox can grow a lot faster than we think. Why don't I set up conditions and see what happens? So I set up a special bioreactor system, anaerobic uh, provided optimal CO2, roughly 1% CO2 concentration in the headspace, aerated it, used different probes to monitor Animox activity. Uh, so that would mean ammonium and nitrite. So keep an eye on that. 
let's put a nitrate probe in there too, make sure I'm not getting nitrification that I somehow fooling myself. Um, nope, that didn't happen. DO probe, no DO because I'm anaerobic. Did all that and got some interesting results. Uh, took a sample, did fish. I had an Anamox fish probe at the time. Looked in a microscope, I blew my eyes out. It was so bright. And what I noticed is that um, it had an anamoxosome. It had irregular um, fluorescence. And I could not explain it until I looked it up in the literature and realized that's what I was looking at. And these organisms are really bright. Uh, usually bright organisms means high levels of ribosomes, means fast growth. Now, all that looked really good. Uh, really high levels of anamox in the enrichment. But I needed to come up with some way to measure it, how fast they're actually growing. So I set up a spectrophotometer took samples and measured for a range of CO2 concentrations and came up with an estimated doubling time of two hours. Two hours. Now, Anamox, what's reported in the literature is, well, let me see if I look at my notes. I believe it's a 20-day doubling time because they're severely inhibiting them with high levels of CO2. If you take care of the CO2, they'll grow a lot faster, according to my preliminary research, not published, but it's there in the patent. So consider that, that maybe some of these organisms like Animox, we're underestimating what they can do. We're, we're not utilizing their full potential because we're holding them back. How about other autotrophs that are known, right? Other ones of interest. How about sulfate reducing bacteria? They cause a lot of odor issues at different places. We know they're in our collection systems, they'll cause stink. What if there was a way we could elevate CO2 temporarily to try to help wash them out? Because if we increase that CO2 level up really high, they're going to grow really slow. They're not going to be able to double as much and stick around, and we should be able to flush them out of the system. Would that work? Maybe. How about dehalogenators? That would include our good friends, the dechlorinators. Soil bioremediation has always been difficult because of the slow times it takes to achieve dechlorination. There are autotrophs. What if we do some simple experiments and find out, can we actually speed up the dechlorination process by reducing the CO2 concentration? Could we do that? What would that mean for the soil bioremediation industry? And finally, my favorite, metals precipitators. So there are some organisms out there that like to precipitate out metals like gold. That's right. So um, there are autotrophs as well. You need hydrogen. You need to have a source of dissolved gold present. So maybe some mining waste streams would have some metals of interest that we could use known organisms that can do metals precipitation and see if we can spur them on to grow faster, which would mean they precipitate better. You could flow more waste through the bioreactor and get better yield. That sounds interesting to me. How about you? And here's a table on the next slide that shows you some of these different known autotrophic uh, metabolisms of interest and where what industries they apply to. So you can take a look at those and get a feel for how many different types of autotrophs there are out there already that we know of that are probably underperforming. So the big question is, that's a fine list, Dr. Stroot. Are there other autotrophs that might be out there? That's the next part of this presentation. You've held on for several minutes listening to me blather on about CO2. And here comes the fun one. Okay, this whole section is about predicted autotrophic metabolisms. Ooh, what a mouthful. Recall that Animox was predicted using thermodynamic analysis. That was the first step. The second long 10-year step was to enrich and isolate the, organ uh, the organism. Okay? It's one of the reasons nobody wants to do this because they see that 10-year gap and they think, do I really want to spend that much time trying to isolate a novel organism? But there's good news. If you paid attention to the first section of this video, I told you all about autotrophs and their sensitivity to CO2, and it obeys Andrews' equation, not Minot kinetics, and you better be paying attention to your CO2 concentration. If you get that dialed in, giving you the big hint right here, about 1% CO2, 
that should speed things up considerably. So if you're trying to isolate organisms, that should help out tremendously. So let's talk about some of the possible organisms. But um, first, let's review thermodynamic analysis. Uh, we'll look at the CO2 reducing methanogen, one of the classic examples that's on this next slide. So what I did is I just simply used the same approach over and over again that I saw in the Animox paper and I see in our textbooks, and it's pretty simple. Start with an overall reaction, so you see it at the top. Now I come up with two half reactions. Uh, most microbiologists would recognize that and probably wince a little bit because they probably didn't like that section of microbiology. <laughs> Engineers would say, mm, no big deal, like me, no big deal, it's just math. So we have a half reaction for the electron acceptor, that's RA, and we have the RD reaction, which is the electron donor half reaction. You have to bring those two together, and they have to balance out, and they have to equal the overall reaction. It's pretty straightforward. So for the methanogen, you have one electron acceptor half reaction. That's the one for CO2 going to methane. And you have a one uh, half reaction for the electron donor. That's hydrogen uh, going to the proton. Okay, and you'll notice I put down there a little line, eight electrons transferred per reaction. So all that means is that each of the half reactions you multiply by eight, add them together, and you'll get your delta G not prime, which is for standard conditions of a negative 130.7 kilojoules per reaction. That's fine. But what you really want is the delta G. You want to correct for non-standard conditions. And I picked hydrogen CO2 at 0 0.05 atmospheres, methane at 90% or 0.9 atmospheres, and all my short-chain fatty acids at 0 0.01 molarity. When I did that, the delta G came out to minus 92.7 kilojoules per reaction. That means it's favorable for growth. But we knew that already as microbiologists because they grow and everybody knows that. Okay. So we got through with that one. How about a propanogen? A propane producing organism. An organism that takes ethane, hydrogen, CO2, and produces propane. Is that possible? What's that mean? Let's take a look. Here's the analysis of that. Here's your overall reaction. What do I see here? I see three hydrogens plus a CO2 plus ethane yields propane plus two waters. Okay, now here's the little tricky part. Microbiologists would wince until they see what I did, and then they might kind of go, oh, that's not so bad. I used to teach my environmental engineering students this all the time, and they would wince too a little bit, but then they realized what I was doing, and they say, oh, I can do that too. It's like, exactly. Anybody can do this. It's easy. All right, so we have one half reaction for the electron acceptor, CO2 going to propane. But I have two half reactions for the electron donor, RD1, RD2. RD1 is for ethane, RD2 is for hydrogen. Now the trick is to recognize that I need to have 20 electrons transfer per reaction, but RD1 and RD2 get only a fraction of that. How much of each? You have to balance the reaction to figure it out. So I've got 14 for RD1 and 6 for RD2. It works, and when you run through it, the reaction, you'll get a delta G not prime of minus 70.8 kilojoules per reaction. That's very good. Looks interesting, but let's correct it for non-standard conditions, the conditions as is. And it works out to minus 40.2 kilojoules per reaction. Favorable. Now, isn't that interesting? So I use the same approach to evaluate a bunch of different metabolisms, including I've got alkanogens or alkanogens. I don't care how you, potato, potato, I don't care how you say it. Alcohologens, there's only one way to say that, uh, and SCFA methylating, because nobody wants to say short chain fatty acid methylating. That's a little difficult to say, but SCFA methylating, that's a little bit easier. So. Why haven't any of these organisms been reported? Because you already know the answer. Because they haven't been able to cultivate them properly because they've had the wrong information. They've been using the wrong CO2 concentration for years and they just simply don't have the time to take, you know, wait 10 years to 
isolate an organism. Who wants to do that? Nobody. Nobody in academia, that's for sure. So now you know that you know, CO2 makes a difference. If we can get that under control, that would mean the process of trying to isolate these types of novel autotrophs probably ought to be a lot faster. Right? So this, the discovery of how to grow autotrophic microbes, optimizing the CO2 concentration, and the search for novel autotrophs, if you put it all together, there's multiple commercialization uh, opportunities. Let's talk about some of those. Okay, I've classified these in different ways. I have, first is evaluation services. Now some of this is borrowed from my own Western Autotroph company back in the heyday. So the first one I came up with was something called nitrocalc. See that? So there, it's actually pretty straightforward. You just simply input some information about your alkalinity and your pH, and it would just chew through the numbers and tell you what's happening with the activity of your high pH nitrifiers, your low pH nitrifiers, and that might give you some guidance on what's happening to your BNR system. So. And a little bit of minor interest in that, but really it's more of a marketing tool to try to get people interested in this, what's happening with, with this. I can use NitroCalc to evaluate this, what's that mean? And then maybe I could get them interested in how we might be able to solve that problem. But first I try to do Nitro more. That's a different opportunity uh, using a mechanical system to try to select for uh, nitrifying bacteria exclusively. So it's interesting. It's in the patents. You can look at there. But the one I was uh, more interested in was... Um, for nitrocalc was to try to um, stabilize the nitrification rate by injecting CO2 in different parts of the aeration basin and try to select for just those uh, low pH loving nitrifying bacteria. So, so that was one evaluation service. I also came up with something called NitroSafe. And there that was, uh, so NitroSafe was taking the same approach but, but applying it to drinking water, especially um, chloramines. And uh, there's a big problem of nitrification happening in our uh, distribution systems periodically. But what if you have the way to measure what your uh, potential is for nitrification in real time? You can measure it as it's being produced, and we can take that into consideration and give some warning about potential nitrification, but also a way to um, reduce the risk of nitrification by injecting CO2 at the right time for the right period of time to try to select against nitrification. So that was NitroSafe. I came up with that one. That's another evaluation service. Okay, um, a second class, new systems for improving water and wastewater systems. Um, okay, we talked about NitroSafe. Again, using the CO2 injection system, you'd partner with the CO2 supplier and you'd come up with a way to evaluate and reduce the risk of nitrification in drinking water systems. Um, we talked about BNR systems with nitrifiers, and maybe there's a way that we could help uh, even the nitrification rate across the entire system and select for one of the two pairs of nitrifying bacteria. I thought there's some potential there. Um, also, we could work with BioN, one of the modeling uh, software that's out there, and customize it so that it actually would reflect the real nitrification sensitivity to CO2 in the system. Uh, I approached them years ago and they didn't seem to be too interested. They liked using bad information, I shouldn't say, uh, simplified information that really wasn't uh, telling them the full story. I think their customers could probably use this and they'd probably be very interested. So that's still out there. In fact, I think there might be a way to license it from BioN and customize it for your own use. Um, but last time I remember talking to them, they wanted to do the customization, but then they were going to have rights to using that proprietary information. Maybe that's okay. Let them have it so that they can actually get the word out and customers are going to want to know, what do we do about this? And if you're the company that provides a solution, you're right there at the right time. Ready to go? And let's see, what else do I have here? Yeah, we already talked about a num a non-bioreactor system for improving BNR systems using a CO2 injection system. Okay. Now, a third class, third opportunity class, would be cell novel bioreactor systems for known autotrophs. 
Remember, the known ones were things like methanogens, anamox, things like that. Um, so here I came up with methanomax. Now that would be a side stream bioreactor that you would set up and you would feed it hydrogen. You'd have to buy the hydrogen. Maybe you can get a good deal in green hydrogen. Or did you do that? You'd have to grow the methanogens in your biomethane reactor, producing biomethane. You'd use the biomethane um, to help um, reduce the CO2 concentration in the headspace of the digester, and you would actually supply the methanogens into the anaerobic digester. So also, if you pay attention to that um, figure, I'm taking some of the biogas from the anaerobic digester and feeding it into the side stream biomethane reactor. So the idea there is it has CO2. Let's take the CO2, convert it to methane, put it back into the biogas reactor. But the biomethane we're going to take out is only going to come from the bio or the methanomax reactor because that's going to have the highest concentration of methane. Right? So that would be a twofer. You're trying to improve your biogas quality, but you're also trying to add methanogens into the digester to try to improve performance, which means you might be able to get by with lower a uh, solid retention time, or you might be able to feed more into that anaerobic digester. Interesting. Um, I also suggested that Methanomax could be used with landfills. Like a bioreactor landfill would be ideal. That you could set the same system up. If you're already going to inject liquid into your landfill trying to promote breakdown of organics, why not put some more methanogens in there? And let's take the gas that you're collecting from the landfill, run it through the biomethane reactor to produce higher quality um, biogas, and let's also try to purge that high CO2 in the, uh, in the headspace, and let's try to uh, reduce CO2 concentration in the landfill to see if we can promote more biomethane production. You still need a hydrogen uh, source, a green hydrogen source, but companies like Waste Management and others might be interested in trying that approach. So that would be a twofer. You take the Methanomax reactor or bioreactor and you would use it for both anaerobic digesters. And that could be anaerobic digesters at the farm, right? Or it can be your municipal uh, anaerobic digester and you could use the same technology for a landfill. So that's three approaches. Um, I have some other notes I have in here. Dehalogenators, you could set up a, a small side stream bioreactor to try to promote uh, dehalogenation, de dechlorination some nasties. If you got some soil that's been difficult and taking a long time to bioremediate, maybe somebody could develop the bioreactor system to see if we can't promote faster rates of dechlorination. Why not? Okay, and here's my, here's the next class, the novel autotrophs class. Um, so here, the simplest way is to simply grow and sell novel autotrophs. Now, novel autotrophs Novel autotrophs could lead to new products in multiple markets. So I have one example. SCFA methylating bacteria. So those are the ones I could take, say, acetic acid and convert it to propionic acid using hydrogen and CO2. Or propionic acid converted to butyric acid using hydrogen and CO2. What if you could get that organism into a tube and sell it? Who would buy it? Well, maybe ruminants, the, the uh, cows and whatnot, the addition of some of these probiotics might actually, it should alter the uh, short chain fatty acid distribution or break down inside the rumen. What kind of impact would that have on things like milk quality? It's interesting. Or meat quality, if it's not for dairy, if it's for meat, would that improve meat flavor? I'd have to defer to my friends on the meat side. Uh, maybe they have some ideas about that. Um, beyond animals, humans may also benefit from this type of organism. It'd be a probiotic, a new one. There's a lot of interest in trying to increase propionic acid and butyric acid in the gut. Well, if you had an organism that could compete with methanogens in the gut for hydrogen and CO2, it could produce more uh, longer chain, short chain fatty acids like propionic acid and butyric acid. There could be some health benefits there. That could be a big money maker. Now, for this, you would have to, for both animals and for the humans, you'd have to demonstrate that these novel autotrophs are grass, generally recognized as safe. Now, I don't have an encyclopedic knowledge of autotrophs, but I'm not aware of any that are pathogenic. So maybe somebody could add a comment if they know of any autotrophic microbes that are pathogens. I'm not aware of any, but 
For that reason alone, you'd have to do some testing to make sure that these organisms are safe for animal and human consumption. So it might take a while for you to get uh, to break into those markets. But that's just one example. Now, I didn't talk about some of the other autotrophs because that's the next section. This is combine novel bioreactors and autotrophs as complete process solutions. Now this one, now this opportunity, we would have to provide periodic refresh autotrophs, I wrote, to ensure performance. You can't guarantee anything forever, but, you know, if you could provide um, a refresh every, I don't know, three months, and you'd get paid for, for providing the refresh for these bioreactors, make sure they're at tip-top performance. That's, uh, that's one idea. Um, you could provide periodic bioreactor maintenance. Get out there and get it cleaned and whipped into shape. Make sure all the probes that you're using are working properly, all the pumps are working properly. You should get paid for that. You could provide industrial gas subscription. You could partner with a large industrial gas supplier, one that is known for, say, by bi, um, biohydrogen or uh, green hydrogen, sorry, green hydrogen provider and work out a deal to buy it in bulk to provide it to your larger customers. Um, you could also assist with downstream product processing and marketing, of course. So there, start with alcanogens or alcanogens, right? Potato, potato, I don't care how you call it, just let's just call it something. Um, so this one I put down this this system. Uh, I call it my bio GTL system. And this one you would work um, with your anaerobic digester. It could also be a landfill. You know, anything that's producing biogas from organics. Here you'd have three side reactors. You have a biomethane, a bioethane, and a biopropane reactor system. You'd feed them hydrogen, promoting the growth of these organisms. You'd move your CO2 and your methane from the headspace of the digester and run it through the biomethane, bioethane, and then biopropane reactors in the hopes of producing biopropane at the, as the end product. Organisms from each of the three bioreactors can be fed to the anaerobic digester to try to promote BioGTL formation directly in the anaerobic digester. Now that would be pretty interesting if we could get that to work, because then you'd have to work with um, a company to help you with collecting biopropane on the back end. There's companies out there that can do that. You've got to demonstrate this works, so um, get this to work. I'm sure municipalities would probably love this instead of dealing with biogas or burning it for heat. They could take the biopropane. It's a lot easier to use that for as a transportation fuel. So keep that in mind. So that's kind of interesting. This could also be applied to a landfill um, that'd be much larger scale. Believe me, that'd be interesting too. And it could also possibly be applied to your agricultural anaerobic digesters. I'm sure farmers could put some of that biopropane to use on the farm. Now, similar to that would be your alcohologens. You could develop a side stream bioreactor to create longer chain alcohols for biofuels. Uh, we've gotten past the ethanol problem in cars, but there's still a lot of interest in trying to improve on that. And I think there's some interest in butanol. So you'd have to go ethanol to propanol, propanol to butanol. So two side stream bioreactors to try to take that ethanol and convert it over to a more useful fuel like butanol. So our corn processors and others like that would probably be very interested in development of this type of system. You'd, again, you'd have to work with probably a green hydrogen provider. Um, so I'll leave that to you guys to try to figure that one out. Last but not least, the call to action. So I went through several different opportunities, told you what's out there, what's, what's possible with autotrophs based on this discovering how to make them grow faster by optimizing CO2 concentration but also the possibility of novel autotrophs, lots of different interesting metabolisms that could be out there. How do we, how do, we do this? How do we commercialize autotrophs, this discovery and this prediction of novel autotrophs? Investments needed, okay? Here's a simple, simple plan on how to move forward, okay? The IP for all those patents at USF is still available. They're sitting there. I tried, remember, I tried to file my own patent application that included all this novel autotrophs and novel bioreactor systems and it couldn't get past the USF patents. I mean, they're very strong. 
So that means if you're interested in this, that's the first step is to probably secure that. Uh, I, the folks at USF are very helpful. Um, they have different ways that you could license it, non-exclusive, exclusive, different markets, try to keep your costs down, of course. Um, so that would probably have to be number one. Uh, you'd have to find a way to license the technology. If you're interested in the novel autotrophs, you have to set up a lab that's capable of isolation. Okay, so that means you're going to have to have a, uh, these are all anaerobes, you're going to have to have an anaerobic tent, you're going to have to have a cryopreservation system, that just means putting them on coal, you know, uh, to, to store them. You would probably want to develop ways that you could store them on the shelf for long term. Maybe, um, there might be some way to laugh lies, there might be some other ways to do it. You might explore that, try to figure that out. So there's lots of uh, work needed on that end. Um, if you're interested in the bioreactors, you would have to have the growth characteristics of the different isolates first in order to make sure you design the right size system. Faster growing organisms require smaller bioreactors. That's the general rule of thumb. So you'd want to really dial that in, make sure you understand how to get them to grow fastest so that you're not setting up these enormous reactors that aren't needed. You would also need to demonstrate bench scale and then pilot scale, of course. So you'd have to be thinking about that, about how you want to set this thing up and what kind of investment you need to make. Now here's some good news. I could be available to help with isolation. And there's another person, my wife. She's a very, very good anaerobic microbiologist. See, I met her in Rob Mackey and Brian White's lab. That's where I met her. She was going through her PhD there training to be an anaerobic microbiologist, a microbial ecologist. She's uh, very skilled. So we're both available. So if there's interest, um, you can take this on your own. You can go to USF, talk to them. I'll put all the contact information down there. You get hold of them right away and they'd love to talk to you. I'll tell you this, that if you involve me in some way that they would more than likely come up with more favorable terms because they like it when the inventor is involved with commercialization efforts of these patents. Just a little tip. So you don't need me, but if you want me to help out, and my wife, we're available. Um, if somebody could figure out a way to do this and set up the proper lab and make the proper uh, pitch to us, then anything's possible. So contact me and I'll uh, let you know um, my availability and what we can do together. I hope you enjoyed this video and please share this with any friends or investors that may be interested in this opportunity. Thank you.